about professional project delivery and how to innovate in delivering major projects. Um, so large kind of infrastructure projects, but also maybe some of those transformation projects across uh, the civil service and the public service as well. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do quick introductions to our four great speakers that we have here today. I'm going to invite each of our speakers to give some short opening remarks just to set the scene. But I am conscious that you've all been sat now for quite a while listening to people. So we are going to allow as much time as possible to come to you for questions. So please, while, while you're listening to the speakers, be thinking about any questions that you've had, and then we'll take questions once we've heard from our panel. So our first speaker will be Nick Smallwood, who is the Chief Executive of the Infrastructure and Projects Authority, head of the government project delivery function here in the UK. Then we will hear from Mikkel Hemmingsen, who is the CEO of Sund and Belt. And then we will hear from Jonas Gruss, who is the EY Denmark and Nordic's government and public sector leader. And last, but by no means least, we'll hear from Matt Briggs, who is the Senior Responsible Officer, Service Modernization Program at the Department for Work and Pensions, also here in the UK. So Nick, I'm going to come over to you and ask you to set the scene for us with some opening comments. Thank you, and good morning, everyone. Um, I think there's never been a more ambitious and challenging time to deliver major capital projects. Certainly in the UK, we have the largest government major project portfolio uh, that we've ever had. Dominated, of course, by infrastructure and post-pandemic, a lot of need to deliver services to citizens, whether it be new hospitals, prisons, schools, linear infrastructure, um, new energy solutions. And so delivering those, in a market where there's high inflation, limited resources, limited skills, you simply have to innovate. You have to be able to do more with less. And in doing all that, you've got to do all the basics as well. You have to get the basics right before you, before you innovate. And that's why we published the Transforming Infrastructure Performance Roadmap to 2030 in the UK government, because we need to do things differently. We need to close a 40% productivity gap. And we're only going to do that by doing things smarter and embracing digital technologies, embracing AI in project delivery. And it means not just the chatbots and generative AI, it means really using data in a different way, automating processes, automating delivery, off-site fabrication. Really exciting for new engineers and new people coming into the marketplace. And I've just mentioned transformation, uh, sort of the transformation infrastructure. Matt, I'm sure, will uh, center on uh, transformation, transformation. Let me pause there. Brilliant, Nick. Thank you. You really did keep it concise for us. Thank you. But that real focus on we have to do things smarter and innovation uh, being a big part of that. Thanks so much, Nick. I'm sure people will have questions for you about the uh, strategy that you mentioned. Uh, Mikkel, coming over to you. Yes, my name is Mikkel and I'm the CEO of Sun and Belt, which is the Danish uh, state-owned company who does mega projects in Denmark. So we're doing like a 10 billion tunnel between Denmark and Germany. We're doing road pricing, these kind of projects. And I think I have two, two uh, advices or shared experiences with you. One is not to innovate, but to repeat. <laughs> uh, second, if you dare it, have an external risk committee. Have somebody coming in and uh, challenging you. It's very annoying, but it actually helps you. Brilliant. That was short. <laughs> Thanks, Mikhail. <laughs> this panel is fantastic. If only every panel were as concise as this. So the key thing there, I think, is be a bit uncomfortable. Make sure you bring external kind yeah. of scrutiny in and open yourself up to that. And maybe there's a risk, I think, with some of the projects that we've had in the UK, and we might get some questions about that, that they haven't done maybe that process and allowed themselves to be kind of scrutinized externally. Mm -hmm. Jonas, over to you. Yeah, we have, we have that in Denmark as well and then the Nordics, so, so it's not unique to the UK. But um, I think it, it's all about thinking about is, is the project uh, necessary? That's the beginning. So you start by, by actually assessing, do you need this process or project or are you actually able to, to extend what you already do? Can you use smart ways of, of innovating in order to prolong the assets that you already have. I think Miguel is working with, with some of that in order to prolong the great belt tunnel, or great belt bridge that we have uh, in Denmark. 
I think it's also about taking your risk early. Uh, also, you alluded to that. Uh, so, so having the, the dialogue and being clear, where do we see uh, the red and the greens? Taking the time. We see a lot of projects are being squeezed in the very beginning. People want to start the digging, but uh, in reality, you need to get your risk parameters in place in order to, uh, to plan your mega projects in the best possible way. And then, of course, sustainability. Uh, it's clear that there's lots of focus on the environment, and there should be. Uh, so you need to also think in, how are we going to plan this? What are we going to look into? Will we find something? I think there are some, some developments around how you, you utilize drones, both flying and auto, underwater drones, that can see a lot more and we can have much more clarity on where to put our mega projects' uh, physical infrastructure. So I will also keep it short. Brilliant. Thank you, Jonas. So echoing what we've heard already about the importance of assessing risks early, uh, knowing kind of your parameters there on that. But also really interesting what you said there about is the project even necessary? That might have been a good question for a particular project here in the UK. Uh, is, is the project necessary or can you do something in a different way? And then I think really interesting what you said about sustainability and using new technology really to help maybe with those sustainability issues. Thanks so much, Jonas. Matt, coming to um, you. Thanks, everyone. Um, it is slightly nerve-wracking having Nick on the <laughs> panel. Um, it's like having my homework marked <laughs> in particular, as I've got an IPA review happening in my programme at the moment um, through it. Um, just a couple of things for me. Firstly, it's just sort of personal, actually. Being here at um, the Excel Centre, I was brought up 400 yards away in custom house in the 70s with high unemployment, high, un high inflation, real challenges within the community. And the power of the welfare state um, there was just amazing um, through it. And it is my role within the programme to make it absolutely great for our 20 million, 22 million customers, our 85,000 colleagues, and to transform for the future. In particular, about joining up services around customers' needs, um, making digital services with a human touch, and becoming a continuously modernising organisation. So whilst I can say that as the destination, a transformation programme is by slightly characterised by you don't actually really know everything that you're going to do to get there. Mm. And therefore, the real important thing to do is actually make the first step. And the biggest challenge that we face is actually enabling the people within the organisation and our customers and the people who are our partners um, there to be brave enough to actually be take some risk on to make that first step. Thanks, Matt. Um, I love that personal touch that you were talking about there and that motivation to make things better for people. I guess my, I am going to come to the audience in a minute, but I guess um, my first question to all of the panel would be, we're talking about two very different types of large projects here. So one is kind of the big, as you call the mega projects, the infrastructure projects. We will all know HS2, for example, in the UK, big projects like that. But you're also talking about big transformative projects, kind of switching to digital, improving services across uh, the civil service and the way we deliver to the public. So my question to the four of you on the panel, they're obviously very different in terms of types of projects, but are there similar characteristics in terms of how you approach those large projects. Nick, as you're marking Matt's homework, I'm going to ask <laughs> you that question first. So for me, the primary question you need to ask is, what's the outcome that you're trying to deliver with your project? You don't build something for the sake of building it. You don't transform for the sake of transforming. The ultimate objective is to deliver an outcome. So defining that very clearly and any elements around that outcome and being clear across stakeholders that that's what the ambition is. Uh, is a fundamental uh, cornerstone. If you don't get that right, you will embrace late changes because key stakeholders will come along with what they considered were the outcomes they wanted and you didn't get that clarified early. Mm -hmm. So for me, that's the, the number one. And there's a whole raft of tools that we've developed in the IPA to help people roadmap, uh, opportunity framing, really having the tough conversations early to understand what the dimensions are, what the barriers are, what the uh, opportunities are and then getting key stakeholders aligned on a decision roadmap to get to the end. Thanks, Nick. And would you also agree with what Mikhail said about the need to have external uh, people coming? Absolutely. In? Absolutely. So, you know, one of the things the IPA does, and we're doing it to Matt right now, <laughs> is uh, deliver an independent assurance. So I don't get to vote on the outcome of an assurance review 
that we orchestrate. We get uh, third parties in, uh, review team leads from outside of government to come and really scrub a project with their experience and expertise completely independent. And I think that's, that's fundamental. Thanks. Mikael, your thoughts on this question of are all, all large projects similar or are there very, you know, lots of differences in those different types of infrastructure projects? I actually think it's quite the same, no matter whether you're doing IT or you're doing construction. You're like, you have to get your core team together <coughs> and you have to have some clear objectives, like don't put in too many different objectives, like, like fix one problem build a bridge, build an IT system, don't do everything mm. just because we have some good people together. Uh, and then second, uh, do something which you've done before. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and, then, and, then, and then last, as I said, like, see it as a learning experience. Like, don't be afraid to have somebody come in to help you. Yeah. And I think, I think what's, what is difficult about this external reviews and with us, like we have like different firms coming in, uh, and like not nice people from uh, the government <laughs> or something, but like people who who work in private companies coming in. And as long as you can get them in this learning mode, it's very nice yeah. actually. And you and you find some risk which you would otherwise not have found until they occurred. So you you would although. Kind of Nick saying there's an independent scrutiny there from what you're saying. Actually, you need to go even more external than that. <coughs> yeah, I think because I think my experience is like I've been a permanent secretary too. So I think what happens is that you tend to negotiate a little bit. If sometimes if it's in government, at least in Denmark, I think you have to have somebody who comes in who has responsibilities mm. and and. Uh, it's, so it's not a negotiation, it's actually a, a real assessment okay. that you're getting. Um, okay, we can maybe take views from the audience on that. I think Nick's yeah. shaking his head thinking <laughs> they are in, independent. But um, Jonas, your thoughts maybe on the types of projects, but also uh, Mikael was saying there, repeat what you've done before if it's worked well, and mm. also treat it as a lesson learned. Do you think globally we learn enough from each other about projects that have worked well? Is there enough sharing of good practice going on? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I totally agree with Mick. There's not enough sharing. Uh, it's clear that, that we see projects making the same mistakes again and again. Uh, we see the starting too early. We see the lack of involvement. I think one of the big similarities there are between big infrastructure projects and then, then these more transformative uh, processes is the involvement of the people. So involvement of the people next to uh, the areas, involving of the people who are actually going to to, to make the transformation happen, because it, it, the outcome is also defined by having the people understanding why are we actually doing this and getting them involved in the early stages of the project. That both goes for the people around it, it also goes for the contractors on mega projects. Get them involved if you mm -hmm. can, uh, what you can share, if you can share some of the risks, it will be much cheaper and you will have a better chance of, of succeeding. And then of course, modulizing and scalability uh, goes without saying, but we just see a lot of unicorn projects still, where you're thinking, why are they inventing everything? Yeah. Steal, steal with pride uh, from your colleagues, as we just uh, talked about before coming. Thanks, Jonas. So I'm gonna, my, I'm gonna ask Matt a final question, and then I'm coming to the audience, okay? So be ready with your questions. But Matt, I feel mean asking this, given that <laughs> what you said about Nick <laughs> at the moment, looking at, but it's not given, <laughs> given what we've just heard then, my question to you is, who have you turned to for kind of good practice? Where have you looked for kind of who's doing things well? And do you feel like you have external scrutiny, given IPA aside, do you feel like you have other people who are kind of steering you? Yeah, um, so where we're looking is everywhere. Public, private, looking at other governments around the world in particular, um, we have a very similar approach to welfareers into Australia. So looking very closely at what they're doing um, through it, but looking at real retail banking, the insurance sector, very similar business models to what the Department for Work Pensions has. So a lot of external looking out. Um, we do have scrutiny in. I, I really come from it, though, that the biggest scrutiny that we have is actually our customers mm -hmm. and actually bringing our customers into what we're actually doing. So a 
quite a good example is we deliver a service for people who are disabled over the age of 70 um, called Attendance Allowance yeah. um, through it. And we've brought some customers actually in and we've changed that whole process from a 50 day journey down to one that's about hours and minutes um, through it. And that's all because of the scrutiny of the customer into this is what's going to make a difference to me. And that's where I think we take our biggest le learnings from. Great, thanks. Okay, I'm coming to the audience now. Any questions that you have, and you might have come, so there's a gentleman here with his hand up, and I'm gonna go to the lady over there who put her hand up, and then I'll come back here as well. So we've got a gentleman there. If you could keep your hand up, yep, yeah, the lady there. <laughs> So could yeah. you just say who you are and what department you're from? And I'll take both those questions uh, together. Okay. Can you hear me, yeah? Okay. Yes, okay. thanks. <laughs> Dov Boonin um, from the Department for Business and Trade. On the, I was actually on the Project Delivery Fast stream before. I um, wanted to ask, what do you see as the, what do you think will be the biggest change to how we deliver projects in a broad sense? You're from a range of sectors. Um, over the next five to 10 years, how, how do you see project delivery transforming what will be the biggest change? Thanks. Are you thinking in light of kind of new technology and how that will change things or anything? Open anything? question. Okay. Yeah, it could be tech. Uh, okay, so first question there, how, what, what do you see as being the biggest changes to the way we deliver large projects? And then the lady there. Hi, Carla Groom, also Department for Work and Pensions. Um, the, <laughs> hi, Matt. Um, the Agile Manifesto is, is, I think, 23 years old now. And I'm just wondering if the lessons about how to do um, project management in an agile way have influenced the way that major projects are being delivered right now. So I didn't catch which manifesto you would... Agile. Agile, okay. Okay, so two questions there. So the Agile Manifesto being 23 years old, so um, maybe is it time for change? And then the question around um, in the next coming years, what's going to be the biggest changes to the way that we deliver projects? Actually, nicely related questions, I think, both of those together. I'm going to shake up the order a little bit. Mikael, I'll come to you first on this one. You well, can I think a answer one or both. So they're yeah. kind of related. Well, I think I can't say what everybody else is going to do, but I think I can say what I'm going to do. And, uh, and we are planning right now to do the next tunnel in, uh, around Copenhagen. And to, to be even more repetitive, we just bought the tunnel factory which we're using to build an existing tunnel. So we're doing 79 tunnel elements, each 220 meters long. So for the next tunnel, we'll do 40 elements. So to become even more repetitive, we just, so we are buying this factory so we can actually make sure that we can do exactly the same thing in the next project. And, and I think if you want to be successful and to manage your supply chains in the future, you have to take more control over them. And this is, this is a quite a big change which will happen, <laughs> which will take place both in our sector, and we see it also in the, in the energy sector, that to take control, you have to own your production facilities. When it comes to agile, I think in the big projects I do, we really resent Agile. We don't want it. We can't control it. It's, uh, you add too much complexity into the project. And um, if you have a couple of thousand people working on a project and you introduce Agile, you have to have a very good project management, I would say, if I could to manage that. And I don't have the self-confidence to do it. Thanks, Mika. So control over the supply chain. You've mentioned again that repetition. So build on what you've done and take it forward to your yeah. next project. And then a resenting of Agile. Be interested to get views in the room because I think it's still uh, the big thing. Nick, did you want to come back on the resenting Agile point? Um, I, I will do because I think uh, um, Mikhail's right to highlight that it's not simple. And I see many examples of people using the word Agile and they're not actually applying Agile. I do see some great examples of it really well applied and well managed. If you look at Universal Credit Project, they had uh, sprint teams, uh, captains, they really understood it and they uh, embraced it. But it's all too often used as a bit of a, a buzzword and badly applied. And I think Mikhail's probably seen plenty of examples of that in his career. So it works, but you've got to really understand it, really apply it well and have skills and expertise to make it work. 
Okay, thanks. And did you want to add anything else on? I, I will, because yeah. I think certainly in the built environment, digitalization and automation is upon us. And it's going to accelerate rapidly in the next five years. Uh, AI will become a thing. If you're not embracing it and applying it, you're going to be left behind. And I think the supply chain needs to transform. So how we use the supply chain simply has to change, given the degree of automation coming. And great examples, if you're not applying 4D CAD and advanced work packaging in the built environment as a client, you, you, you're losing out. You're losing out big time on productivity. And so that means you've got to have an integrated design. Well, in infrastructure, right now, quite often we go to the architects. Then we go to the main works contractors. Then we go to the finishers and the instrument and uh, electrical uh, engineers. That has to change. Every project needs an integrator. Otherwise, you can't embrace digital. So by definition, we need to fundamentally reset our supply chain and embrace the art of the possible. Because I think once you do that, and I always use the example when I was in the oil and gas world, I used to look at the automotive industry as best practice. And they moved from, if you can remember back in the 80s, of being a very unproductive, uh, unsuccessful industry to early 90s using robotics for the first time. Now, what they're doing using digitalization and supply chain transformation is amazing. And I think you're going to have that same mindset in infrastructure. We have to change that world, and clients are in the lead to do that. And the technology is old hat right now, actually. 4D CAD, I was using it in 2016. Mm -hmm. I think there's one project in the UK now embracing it, and we need every project in the built environment to be embracing it. Brilliant, thank you. It's interesting how, how many issues, whether it's large projects or transformation, you mentioned there the need for integration. It's about how you can work across different silos, different professions, and actually that collaboration piece yep. uh, so important. Matt, I'm going to come to you and then Jonas on these questions, and I know we've got lots of other questions. Yep. Um, from a purely transformation perspective, I think there is going to be some fundamental shifts um, in the next 10 years. The biggest, I think, is actually going to be about democratising innovation. I think we're putting the power into all of our users' hands. Um, AI is going to transform the way our customers actually interact with us, not just how we provide services, how you start to move towards no code, low code, what quantum computing is going to bring um, going forward. It is going to be a significant shift, and that democratizing innovation is going to be, take a lot of thought. And that can be a very unagile um, approach to it, that a lot of people want to put controls around um, that to slow that innovation down. And I think there's going to be some real challenges, I think, for us with inside public services about how we respond to that um, through it. On the question specifically about Agile, I agree absolutely with Nick. When it's done well, it is a really great mm. approach. Too often, though, it is used as a badge for not actually doing proper process. We don't know what the answer is, so it's Agile. Um, through it, and I think that's the, one of the big things that we're trying to actually move away from across all of our public services in the way that we deliver transformation programs. Thanks, Matt. Jonas. Yeah, maybe just continuing on on the agile uh, approach. It's also when we have a world that has like had waterfalls, and we have the waterfalls targets, and then we try to squeeze in agile in the middle, then it, it becomes very very difficult. So if you have the agility around, uh, when are you actually ending your projects? Then uh, then it will of course be much easier. Uh, we we just don't often see that as the case, um, but. What one area where we see that there are uh, developments are, of course, also towards how you work together with your vendors. Uh, can you be more specific on, on the what and not the how, so that you allow new technology to come into play? We have seen examples of, of projects that have been you know, locked on old technologies because that was the agreement they made maybe five years ago, when new uh, technology have come into play and we don't utilize that. I fully agree also with the points on, on automation, uh, the automotive industry, of course, uh, being very um, much in front. If, if we look at big construction companies, uh, for sure, we do see that development. Uh, we talked a bit about drones, and it's clear with drones and AI, there's, there's some combination also looking at how we're going to, to both work underwater and, and above. Uh, so so I, think, I think there, there will be a lot of uh, new technologies coming in, but I think the big, the big thing that will change is that we are more structured about using the same models, not getting the architects in too early, but getting them in in the end in order to make sure that we are cost efficient. 
thanks. Now, I know we've got a question here. A gentleman had his hand up here, but I'm conscious that it's a large room, and I want to make sure if you've got... Yeah, so there's... Can we get a mic down there as well? And then I'll come up here. But I want to make sure we go to all corners of the room. So, yeah, lady at the back there, keep your hand up. You've got your hand up back row, I think. If we go there, and the gentleman here that had his hand up first yeah put it up high so our guy with the mic can see and then i will come back there's a lady at the back there okay we'll take these two questions next thanks hello james waddell from the dvla uh, my question is to matt uh, from dwp and the reason for that is that uh, we're both in operational delivery and i was fascinated to see or oh, hear that you are looking externally <coughs> excuse me uh, to Australia and insurance companies. What have you learnt regarding innovation that you can map into DWP? Maybe that's something that lots of operational delivery areas could learn from. Thank you. Great. Well, actually, I'll let you answer that one. And then, so if you could get the mic ready for that lady who had her hand at the back here that you were pointing, then I'll take those two in a minute. But that, because that was just for you, Matt, if you yeah. don't mind answering that one. The two specific things that we've learnt is make sure that you've got the right leadership in place um, through it, that there are people who are out there who are ambitious to make change, and that you also have people in leadership roles that are about safeguarding the service. But making sure you've got the right character of leadership in those different roles. It's not just about capabilities, it's about their behavior. So that's the first um, thing. Um, and then the second is people really holding on closely to the vision of what they're trying to achieve, but potentially holding their plan quite loose um, through it, so that they can respond quickly to events um, that happen within the environments that you're actually working in. I think when I started the program, AI was robotics. We were into the program now, generative AI is there. If we'd have stuck rigidly to a plan, we would have been probably five years behind. So you've got to hold your plan loosely and just seeing other organizations about how they manage that portfolio to make sure that it retains some flexibility. Thanks. I mean, there's an obvious follow-up to that, which is can we afford to pay the right leaders in the public sector compared to what they could get in the private sector? Can I, can I have a go yeah. at that? Well, I've been in DWP for 33 years, and I think there are some exceptional people in public service, and we don't give them enough credit. So yeah. I'm just going to be quite blunt around that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, a round of applause there. Completely agree. Um, there was a lady over there. If we take your question, and then we'll come to the lady there. Hello. Um, I'm Sarah Mussman. I'm in Building Digital UK. Um, it's part of GSET. Um, this question's probably for Nick, um, but just a pattern that we're seeing is that digital infrastructure is enabling every other sector, every other utility to digitalize. So I guess just what advice would you give us in um, accelerating collaboration across sectors? Um, yeah, thank you. Thanks. Nick, I will come to you then on that one, because I know we've got loads of other questions. So. So I think the key thing for me is to be clear as the client and put your requirements into everything we put into the marketplace. Quite often we carry it in our heads or we've got an idea of what we want, but if you don't ask, you're not going to get. And I think we've got a very reluctant supply chain to change right now. And I say that because actually most of the supply chain in the UK is paid on an hourly basis. And if we find smart, innovative ways of doing it 40% less, that's 40% less hours. So unless the client owns that, and understands the art of the possible, it's not going to happen. So we've got to drive that uh, integration. We've got to drive that expectation. Uh, and we've got to play the, 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 the bridging part to other parts of the sector. Otherwise, I think we will be sitting hoping things will get better and, and, and they won't. Thanks, Nick. Um, feel free, when I come, if you also want to talk about collaboration across sectors, do come in on that. But we have a question here. Hello panel and hello audience. I'm Sophie Eager from the Ministry of Justice and I want to pick up on two trends that are emerging from what you're saying. One is the democratizing um, large chain program, so bringing everyone in. And the second is around, I think you said Matt, about not knowing what's coming, dealing with ambiguity. How do you create that capability in a huge organization for people to be able to be brave and face uncertainty, have a kind of a North Star out there, but also not know what's coming at scale? Because that's 
pretty hard. Thanks. Great question. So I'm going to put that to all of you. So when you're working on a major project, how do you keep the endpoint in sight, whether it's transformation internally or a big infrastructure project, but also maintain the ability to pivot if you need to pivot? Um, Mikkel, I'll come to you. Well, I think to answer the questions about, about the IT systems, that's, I don't know whether you have a data model for, for doing construction in the UK. I think, I think that's a good place to start. Like, like your data is born somewhere and you want to use it eventually for asset management. Mm -hmm. and, and my experience is that most companies, and especially not governments, don't have a, uh, don't have a data model. And, uh, and without a data model, it's very difficult to collaborate, actually. Mm -hmm. And it's, so I think that's one of the basics which you have to get right. Like getting into the democratization piece, I think I think you can choose to involve citizens in developing your systems. It's just very annoying because they have all kinds of ideas and things <laughs> which you have to listen to then. And then you have to act upon it. And, and I, think, <coughs> I think there's a tendency that many institutions see it as annoying to involve the citizens. And, and uh, it has to be done anyway. Like for instance, we're doing infrastructure projects, like we're taking out nature we're taking out, uh, we, have to, we have to remove houses and things like that. So you have to do it in a very good way and, and to invite the people into the dialogue. So we have, we have dialogue teams employed that goes out even, even before we start designing the projects to actually, uh, to actually talk with the people. We have involved in nature conversation uh, <coughs> organizations in our projects so we actually we actually like when we're doing infrastructure we are creating more biodiversity that's our promise afterwards than there were before mm. so we have uh, we have a three to one ambition so we if, if we're taking out one acre or, or one hectare of, of uh, land in, in at land or at sea we're giving back three where we are creating then uh, more biodiversity. So I think you can do it. It's, it's, it costs some money and, and it takes some time, but it can work very well. So we have a very nice collaboration, I would say, both with, both with the citizens and with the nature organizations in doing this. Mm. And, uh, but <clears throat> I think it's, my experience is that it's difficult in the political process mm. because who's then really uh, running the project. Is it the citizens or is it the politicians? And interesting then, I guess the, you could say then it's obviously nobody would be against consulting citizens and bringing them in on the design, but you have to manage the expectations. You don't want to then set expectations yeah, that you can't possibly meet. I think like if somebody like, like your political boss came out and said, I want to do this project, and then you have a dialogue with the citizens and it turns out that you should actually, to achieve the goal, do a different project, how do you manage that? And, and it's difficult for civil servants, that's, that's my experience, to take that dialogue because it's actually the politicians should, who should have the dialogue to make it right. I think you've just, and, uh, you just described what being a civil servant is actually like, I think, at the <laughs> core of it. Um, yeah. Nick, did you want to come in yeah. on both the democratisation, but also I, want this, I don't want to lose sight of this ability to pivot as well if you need to. Yeah. Yeah, so I'd just share a, a personal experience I had. Last project I was program director on, and it was seven sub-projects, all uh, several hundred million uh, dollars. And um, the project teams were all competing, and I arrived at this, this project. It was in distress. And I said, we're not running a democracy. We're going over here. And I set the North Star, essentially, because you've got to be clear on what your objectives are as a team. And we reset, and we re-pivoted. And there was a palpable thank goodness for that. You know, the project team appreciated that they had direction and clarity. Prior to that, they were all trying to do their best of their own little bit of a complex jigsaw puzzle. So for me, um, projects are delivered by people and leadership is absolutely fundamental. So we're not running democracies. We actually have to embrace the democratic processes. And quite frankly, the best projects I've seen go through our complex planning systems in the UK 
are those projects that actually do the best job of stakeholder engagement and community engagement, really understanding local needs, and they tend to have the shortest duration through the, the planning life cycle. So it's being democratic at the right time, but when you're actually then delivering the project, you move into delivery mode, you actually have to have the North Star, the objectives, that outcome I talked about before, and then be ruthless in driving towards that, and not be swayed by scope changes and great ideas that come along on your journey. And everybody loves scope changes. I have a passionate dislike of scope changes. Once we've agreed what we're doing, it's frozen. And when I say frozen, it's like minus 28 degrees. It's solid, it's gone, we're done. So that's really interesting because Jonas, yeah, I want to come to you, but that that kind of goes against then, are you missing out on new innovations as they come along, like and, being able to... And that's fine, but if I changed everything every time someone had a great idea, I'd never finish. Okay. And I can guarantee one thing, the cost will be out of control. So generative change is okay. So if you've got a 20-year program, uh, and Universal Credit's a great example where uh, the SRO has taken opportunities on a time-based basis to introduce new policy. But it isn't new every week because that just doesn't pay. Yeah. And in the built environment, I'm sorry, you need to do the front homework to understand what it is you're going to do and then only build that because everyone will come up with a great idea and they all cost money and I guarantee you they will not pay back. Thanks. Jonas and Matt, do you want to add anything to this? Because I know we've got lots of other questions coming in. And, and just briefly, just briefly, uh, of course, the longer within the project cycle, the more expensive it is to pivot. So, so involve the people from the very beginning. It's also clear, again, talking about AI and logarithms, we, algorithms, we see a lot of private companies really being clever about how to use algorithm in order to understand the needs of the people, the needs of their uh, customers. So, of course, that, that you hear people, that you actually understand what people want, uh, that's, that's, that's an area where we can learn a lot and uh, where we can be very clear from the beginning. And of course, there will be some times where there need to be a change, but it is super expensive and you also need to have this minus 28 degrees at some point. <laughs> Thanks. Matt? Um, I just want to sort of pick up on the democratizing innovation um, point. There are, there's big and small mm. within that. There is sort of very big, hold the North Star, hold your outcome there. The small bit around that is how do you create a psychologically safe place for people to have a go at delivering something and potentially failing um, through it. And the soft signals that you send as a leader, the organisation sends in its performance management and its quality management frameworks, how we may actually make services available to people so if you can't actually access wi-fi in a building like this what signal are you actually sending to your people in terms of do you want them to be innovative or not so they're sort of big and small and those soft signals are really really important about how you actually hold the scope of your program thanks so um lady down here had a question i think at the front and then i haven't come to this side do, do we yet yeah, there's a <laughs> Gentlemen, right at the front here. So we've got two questions along the front, and then I might start just in the time we've got left. So if you could keep your hand up, yep, there. And then, gentlemen, on the front row down here, if you could stick your hand right up, and we need some bobbing like in Parliament, don't we? Just down there, thanks. So if you Thank get the you. mic to the gentleman on the front row while we Thank take you. this question. Uh, yeah. Uh, absolutely agree the uh, freezing of scope for delivery. In a world where things are changing very, very fast, especially as we discussed this morning, this decade, it will be truly transformative. How can we be sure, how can be sure that where we want to go will be still relevant hmm. at the point of delivery? Thanks. So coming back to, again, can you really be sure that the North Star will still be the North Star that you want in, say, 10 years' time? And then, gentlemen, there, your question there. Uh, yeah, Neil Dempsey from Grant Thornton. Uh, picking up on the, the soft signals piece, as programme leaders, how do you foster that culture of learning and the kind of culture of openness, particularly perhaps when things are challenging? Thanks. So I'm going to start with you, Matt, on the how do you foster... That. How do you give people space, essentially, to experiment um, without thinking if it goes wrong that they're going to be penalised for it? Um, I think there's firstly about yourself as an individual. If your first response to something going wrong is throwing your hands up in the air and running around screaming, 
um, through it, it is not going to set the signals right in the organisation. So there is a leadership capability that you need to be able to be the person who steps back, looks at the bigger picture and says, well, actually, what we're going to do is actually move in this direction as a consequence of that learning. So your own behaviour as a leader is just really, really important. Um, the second is making it actually part of the programme. So we have deliberately gone out and created an ethos we call Connect, Share, Grow, and saying, actually, we are going to deliberately make it a learning experience for everyone with inside the program, and we're going to actually foster that, and we're going to celebrate the things where people are actually open and saying, I, this didn't work in the way that we expected, but we learnt this for the next time that we actually do it and using things like the equivalent of TED Talks for people to actually be able to present that information. But it's been a deliberate thing to say we are, that is what we are as a programme. Um, through it, we are deliberately a learning programme. Thanks. Jonas, did you want to pick up on the, the leadership issue or on the, are you, are you really sure that 10 years' time we're going to be going in the right direction? Um, I think I think both questions are super relevant. Uh, I think you you answered well on 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 the leadership part. It's it's clear that that project managers are often raised to focus on their own project, but uh, you have to give them a sense of belonging and making sure that see themselves as part of the the full team. This is not if they succeed with their little bit, but the team as a whole doesn't deliver, then uh, it doesn't give any uh, value. So you need you need to see it as a group, and you need to have this learning uh, room where, where it's okay to, to stick your hand up and it's also okay to make mistakes uh, and, and talk about them. Uh, and, and, and that's maybe coming to the other uh, question, what do you do in a situation where what you are, your North Star is no longer valid? Well, sometimes you also have to, to stop. I mean, uh, it's, it surprises me the, the, the number, the very small number of, of political ideas that are being turned down. Maybe you're better at it than the UK, I don't know, but, but, but we see all these ideas coming and, and everyone is, oh yeah, maybe that could happen. Instead of going through it early and making sure, is this really tested? Uh, of course, changes can come and then, of course, then there's also an option to close the project down. Mm, thanks. Um, so, Mikael, Nick, I think it was a bit of a challenge to you because you were both very clear. I think once you've decided, you go for it. Head down, you go for it. Yep. But a bit of a challenge there. The yep. world is changing fast. Technology is changing fast. Should you lift the head, lift your head and go, actually, maybe that isn't where we want to go now? So I think that the answer is that um, things will change. If you've got a program over 10 years, the reality is the world changes. Um, but it depends what context you have. It's very different building a linear infrastructure solution between point A and point B. Uh, in that case, you need to look and say, we're moving to a net zero world, so don't build something and find 10 years from now it's not going to meet that expectation. That's very different than building a number of hospitals where clinical needs are going to change over the next uh, decade. And therefore, you need to build a flexible solution rather than a traditional building. And that's very different than a transformation program uh, delivering benefits to citizens where every five years things change fundamentally and you need to adapt. So we do take those changes into account. Uh, the challenge is to make sure that in doing that, you don't hesitate and change the scope every five minutes because you will never get anything done. So if you take the example of the hospitals, we will come down to a design for the hospitals, but we'll make sure it's flexible enough that we can add to it, change it later but you have to start the build and build what you plan to build, if that makes sense. Yeah. Mikael. Well, I don't think it's new what you're saying, actually. I think we've, if you have long projects, like they've always been faced with difficulties, like then we had COVID, then we couldn't get steel, like there's always new things coming along. So I think, I think the best advice is to make short projects. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, if you can't make short projects, then have a good risk management in your long project. Yeah. And uh, which is why I started out saying, I think, I actually think that installing an external risk committee is, is what you as a CEO or a leader can do to actually demonstrate that you're not afraid of having somebody coming in <coughs> helping you. Mm. And, and it's, I think it's very uncomfortable in the beginning, but once you get used to it, it's actually very nice to have somebody you can talk to. Yeah. 
as 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 the leader of the organization who can help you, and and uh, it also means that you're the first one who's going to get fired if something goes wrong, which is also like you're sticking your neck up for your organization. Yeah. So so uh, if you have to do long projects, like make sure you get this risk management culture implemented. Thanks, Michael. We are going, we've got five minutes left, I think. We're just shaving off 10 minutes from the coffee break, I think, because we overran slightly in that first session. So the final two uh, questions, let me see. We've got a gentleman with his hand up here and we've got the man there. Uh, yep. So let's take that question and then gentleman here, if you could put your hand up again so that you get the mic, that would be great. Would you like to ask your question? Thanks. Great, thanks. Um, my name is Finlay Clark, I'm from the Ministry of Justice, um, and my question is, in transformation projects, particularly in a digital context, how do you make sure that we're genuinely innovating and not just duplicating an existing structure in another mm. environment? How do we make sure we get the most out of new technologies and genuinely innovate? And because we've kind of touched on it a little bit already, then is there a circumstance where it's okay not to innovate, or do we have to keep pushing the envelope? Do we always have that responsibility? Thanks. So the first question, how do you know you're not, you're not just repeating without innovating? I think that's quite a good question. And then the question here. Hello, Liam Askins from the Department for Leveling Up. So local government's probably one of our biggest delivery partners. And devolution means that there will be a lot more delivery done at a local level in place. So my question is, what innovations are possible where you have multiple projects in a place uh, specifically, perhaps? Thanks. So I didn't hear Sorry, the end of that. Up. What? So, if you, so what innovations are possible where you have multiple projects in a place, i.e., you know, the sort of program no, economies right of scale? Thanks. So, or lots of projects going on at the same time. How can you innovate in that space? Okay, in the time that we've got, you can ask answer one of those two questions. You choose which one. So, either how do you make sure you're actually innovating, not just repeating again? Um, even if it's worked well, how do you make sure you are factoring innovation? And then how do you build innovation in where there are multiple projects going on at the same time? Um, I will change the order and we'll go this way around. So, Matt. I'll go with the question about um, are we just repeating or are we innovating? I'd slightly want to challenge the hypothesis of the question. Um, they're actually reusing successful outcomes and things that have been delivered elsewhere is actually a form of innovation. So I think there would be, first is just like the hypothesis. The second is, actually, you've just got to keep looking outwards. Just look at what's happening outside of your environment and actually see what you can actually bring back in um, through it. And the, the skill of a leader is to actually judge the things are the right things to bring back in mm -hmm. and not go, it's everything that's out there. Thanks, Matt. Jonas. Yeah, continue on that question. We, we have seen a lot of examples on innovative procurement where you make sure that there is a sort of uh, innovation in, in your processes. It's also clear that as Matt is stating, is, is it innovation for the sake of innovation or do we want to, to build to the most effective manner? Um, I, think, I think there's a lot of innovation also in, in continuing using the model approach. It's also clear that when we have projects where we don't know how to solve them, we need to get market dialogues, and that could be by, uh, by innovative procurement measures. Thanks. Mikael. Well, like 20 years ago, I ran the Danish e-government program, and we were looking into like, how could we innovate society. And I think, I think our approach was that we had to get some things right, which was kind of like to have a digital signature so we could communicate, and then to have a common language so that we could actually transmit between agencies and, and then once that was done, I think innovation came, because then, then all uh, local governments, central governments could like bring out services to the citizens, and things started, started evolving. But I think to actually do the innovation, you have to get, you have to get the fundamentals right first. Uh, otherwise, it's just, it's just too complex. <coughs> and so, and I think like, at least, in Denmark, like this, this digital signature which we created has enabled us to make, to make most services 100% digital today. So people don't get mail from government, you get emails from government and you get them in your secure uh, e-box server. And, and, then, and then you can have small innovations taking place. And I think you shouldn't, 
And I think that's my advice, at least, like get the fundamentals right and, and then have everybody contribute with different services, whether it's from tax department or pension department or, or your local government. But don't invent your own digital signature, each of you. Thanks, Mikko. And Nick, the final thoughts from you. Yeah, so reflecting on how do you innovate in a portfolio environment with multiple projects, uh, quite frankly, there's no simple solution. Um, I think local authorities, the larger lo local authorities in the UK have done a really good job of integrating housing, transport solutions, etc. But if they're expected to do even more, that's my worry, that they don't have the capacity and capability to do more. So actually, that tells me they're going to have to innovate. They're going to have to find ways of delivering more with less. So that gets you into uh, design one, build many, automation, stealing designs with pride, getting delivery partners and others to come and help them. Uh, and it's going to be a challenge, I think, in that space. So no, no magic bullet, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm.